Under the Hill by Aubrey Beardsley. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Amy Graymore, Holton, Maine. Chapter One The Abbe Franfreluch, having lighted off his horse, stood doubtfully for a moment beneath the umber gateway of the mysterious hill troubled with an exquisite fear lest a day's travel should have too cruelly undone the laboured niceness of his dress his hand slim and gracious as la marquise de defon in the drawing de commentale played nervously about the gold hair that fell upon his shoulders like a finely curled peruke and from point to point of a precise toilet the fingers wandered quelling the little mutinies of cravat and ruffle it was taper time when the tired earth puts on its cloak of mists and shadows when the enchanted woods are stirred with light footfalls and slender voices of the fairies when all the air is full of delicate influences and even the bow seated at their dressing-tables dream a little a delicious moment thought fran Feluch, to slip into exile the place where he stood waved drowsily with strange flowers heavy with perfume dripping with odours gloomy and nameless weeds not to be found in Menzelius, huge moths so richly winged they must have banqueted upon tapestries and royal stuffs slept on the pillars that flanked either side of the gateway and the eyes of all the moths remained open and were burning and bursting with a mesh of veins the pillars were fashioned in some pale stone and rose up like hymns in the praise of pleasure for from cap to base each one was carved with loving sculptures showing such a cunning invention and such a curious knowledge that fran Freluch lingered not a little in reviewing them they surpassed all that japan has ever pictured from her maisons verts all that was ever painted in the cool bathrooms of cardinal lamotte and even outdid the astonishing illustrations to jones's nursery numbers a pretty portal murmured the abbe correcting his sash as he spoke a faint sound of singing was breathed out from the mountain faint music as strange and distant as sea legends that are heard in shells the vespers of helen i take it said fran Freluch, and struck a few chords of accompaniment ever so lightly upon his lute softly across the spellbound threshold the song floated and wreathed itself about the subtle columns till the moths were touched with passion and moved quaintly in their sleep one of them was awakened by the intenser notes of the abbe's lute strings and fluttered into the cave fran Freluch felt it was his cue for entry adieu he exclaimed with an inclusive gesture and good-bye madonna as the cold circle of the moon began to show beautiful and full of enchantments there was a shadow of sentiment in his voice as he spoke the words would to heaven he sighed i might receive the assurance of a looking-glass before i make my debut however as she is a goddess i doubt not her eyes are a little sated with perfection and may not be displeased to see it crowned with a tiny fault a wild rose had caught upon the trimmings of his ruff and in the first flush of displeasure he would have struck it brusquely away and most severely punished the offending flower but the ruffled mood lasted only a moment for there was something so deliciously incongruous in the hardy petal's invasion of so delicate a thing that friend Feluch withheld the finger of resentment and vowed that the wild rose should stay where it had clung a passport as it were from the upper to the underworld the very excess and violence of the fault he said will be its excuse and undoing a tangle in the tassel of his stick stepped into the shadowy corridor that ran into the bosom of the wan hill stepped with the admirable aplomb and unwrinkled suavity of don john chapter two before a toilet that shone like the altar of notre dame de victoires helen was seated in a little dressing-gown of black and heliotrope the coiffeur cosme was caring for her scented chevelure and with tiny silver tongs warm from the caresses of the flame made delicious intelligent curls that fell as lightly as a breath about her forehead and over her eyebrows and clustered like tendrils round her neck her three favourite girls papillard blanchemans and lorraine waited immediately upon her with perfume and powder in delicate flagons and frail cassolettes and held in porcelain jars the ravishing paints prepared by chatelaine for those cheeks and lips that had grown a little pale with anguish of exile 
her three favorite boys, Claude, Claire, and Saracine, stood amorously about with salver, fan, and napkin. Millamont held a slight tray of slippers, Minette some tender gloves. La Popelinière, mistress of the robes, was ready with a frock of yellow and white. La Zambinella bore the jewels, Florizel some flowers, Amador a box of various pins, and Vadius a box of sweets. Her doves, ever in attendance, walked about the room that was panelled with the gallant paintings of Jean-Baptiste Dorat, and some dwarfs and doubtful creatures sat here and there, lolling out their tongues, pinching each other, and behaving oddly enough. Sometimes Helen gave them little smiles. As the toilet was in progress, Mrs. Marsipal, the fat manicure and fardeuse, strode in and seated herself by the side of the dressing-table, greeting Helen with an intimate nod. She wore a gown of white watered silk with gold lace trimmings and a velvet necklet of false vermilion. Her hair hung in bandeau over her ears, passing into a huge chignon at the back of her head, and the hat, wide-brimmed and hung with a valance of pink muslin, was floral with red roses. Mrs. Marsupple's voice was full of salacious unction. She had terrible little gestures with the hands, strange movements with the shoulders, a short respiration that made surprising wrinkles in her bodice, a corrupt skin, large horny eyes, a parrot's nose, a small loose mouth, great flaccid cheeks, and chin after chin. She was a wise person, and Helen loved her more than any other of her servants, and had a hundred pet names for her, such as Dear Toad, Pretty Paul, Cock Robin, Dearest Lip, Touchstone, Little Cough Drop, Bijou, Buttons, Dear Heart, Dick Dock, Mrs. Manley, Little Nipper, Cacondelet, Naughty Naughty, Blessed Thing, and Trump. The talk that passed between Mrs. Marsupple and her mistress was of that excellent kind that passes between old friends, a perfect understanding giving to scraps of phrases their full meaning, and to the merest reference a point. Naturally, friend Verluch, the newcomer, was discussed a little. Helen had not seen him yet, and asked a score of questions on his account that were delightfully to the point. The report and the quaffing were completed at the same moment. Cosme said Helen. You have been quite sweet and quite brilliant. You have surpassed yourself to-night. Madame flatters me, replied the antique old thing, with a girlish giggle under his black satin mask. Gad, madam, sometimes I believe I have no talent in the world, but to-night I must confess to a touch of the vain mood. It would pain me horribly to tell you about the painting of her face. Suffice it that the sorrowful work was accomplished, frankly magnificently and without a shadow of deception helen slipped away the dressing-gown and rose before the mirror in a flutter of frilled things she was adorably tall and slender her neck and shoulders were wonderfully drawn and the little malicious breasts were full of the irritation of loveliness that can never be entirely comprehended or ever enjoyed to the utmost her arms and hands were loosely but delicately articulated and her legs were divinely long from the hip to the knee, twenty-two inches, from the knee to the heel, twenty-two inches, as befitted a goddess. Those who have seen Helen only in the Vatican, in the Louvre, in the Uffizi, or in the British Museum, can have no idea how very beautiful and sweet she looked, not at all like the lady in L'Empriere. Mrs. Marsupple grew quite lyric over the dear little person, and pecked at her arms with kisses. "'Dear tongue, you must really behave yourself.' said Helen, and called Millamont to bring her the slippers. The tray was freighted with the most exquisite and shapely pantofles, sufficient to make Cluny a place of naught. There were shoes of grey and black and brown suede, of white silk and rose satin, and velvet and sarsnet. There were some of sea-green sown with cherry blossoms, some of red with willow branches, and some of grey with bright-winged birds. There were heels of silver, of ivory, and of gilt, there were buckles of very precious stones set in most strange and esoteric devices. There were ribbons tied and twisted into cunning forms. There were buttons so beautiful that the buttonholes might have no pleasure till they closed upon them. There were soles of delicate leathers scented with marachal, and linings of soft stuffs scented with the juice of July flowers. But Helen, finding none of them to her mind, called for a discarded pair of blood-red marrakin diapered with pearls. These looked very distinguished over her white silk stockings. Meantime, 
La Popolinaire stepped forward with the frock. I shan't wear one tonight, said Helen. Then she slipped on her gloves. When the toilet was at an end, all her doves clustered round her feet, loving to frolla her ankles with their plumes, and the dwarfs clapped their hands and put their fingers between their lips and whistled. Never before had Helen been so radiant and compelling. Spiridion, in the corner, looked up from his game of spellicans and trembled. Just then, Prince Mungel announced that supper was ready upon the fifth terrace. Ah, cried Helen, I'm famished. Chapter 3 She was quite delighted with Fran Freluch, and of course he sat next to her at supper. The terrace made beautiful with a thousand vain and fantastical things, and set with a hundred tables and four hundred couches, presented a truly splendid appearance. In the middle was a huge bronze fountain with three basins. From the first rose a many-breasted dragon, and four little loves mounted upon swans, and each love was furnished with a bow and arrow. Two of them that faced the monster seemed to recoil in fear. Two that were behind made bold enough to aim their shafts at him. From the verge of the second sprang a circle of slim golden columns that supported silver doves with tails and wings spread out. The third, held by a group of grotesquely attenuated satyrs, was centered with a thin pipe hung with masks and roses and capped with children's heads. From the mouths of the dragon and the loves, from the swan's eyes, from the breasts of the doves, from the satyr's horns and lips, from the masks at many points, and from the children's curls, the water played profusely, cutting strange arabesques and subtle figures. The terrace was lit entirely by candles. There were four thousand of them, not numbering those upon the tables. The candlesticks were of a countless variety, and smiled with moulded cacconeries. Some were twenty feet high, and bore single candles that flared like fragrant torches over the feast, and guttered till the wax stood round the tops in tall lances. Some hung with dainty petticoats of shining lustres, had a whole bevy of tapers upon them devised in circles, in pyramids, in squares, in cuneiforms, and single lines regimentally, and in crescents. Then on quaint pedestals, and terminal gods, and gracious pilasters of any sort, were shell-like vases of excessive fruits and flowers that hung about and burst over the edges and could never be restrained. The orange trees and myrtles, looped with vermilion sashes, stood in frail porcelain pots, and the rose trees were wound and twisted with superb invention over trellis and standard. Upon one side of the terrace a long gilded stage for the comedians was curtained off with pagonian tapestries, and in front of its music stands were placed. The tables arranged between the fountain and the flight of steps to the sixth terrace were all circular, covered with white damask and strewn with irises, roses, king cups, columbines, daffodils, carnations, and lilies, and the couches, high with soft cushions and spread with more stuffs than could be named, had fans thrown upon them. Beyond the escalier stretched the gardens, which were designed so elaborately and with so much splendor that the architect of the Fête d'Armelac could have found in them no matter for cavil. And the still length strewn with profuse barges full of gay flowers and wax marionettes, the alleys of tall trees, the arcades and cascades, the pavilions, the grottoes, and the garden gods, all took a strange tinge of revelry from the glare of the light that fell upon them from the feast. The frockless Helen and Fran Freluch, with Miss Marsupple and Claude and Claire and Farsi, the chief comedian, sat at the same table. Fran Freluch, who had doffed his travelling suit, wore long black silk stockings, a pair of pretty garters, a very elegant ruffled shirt, slippers, and a wonderful dressing gown, and Farsi was in ordinary evening clothes. As for the rest of the company, it boasted some very noticeable dresses, and whole tables of quite delightful coiffures. There were spotted veils that seemed to stain the skin, fans with eye slits in them, through which the bearers peeped and peered. Fans painted with figures and covered with the sonnets of Sporian and the short stories of Scaramouche, and fans of big living moths stuck upon mounts of silver sticks. There were masks of green velvet that made the face look trebly powdered, masks of the heads of birds, of apes, of serpents, of dolphins, of men and women, of little embryons, and of cats. Masks like the faces of gods, masks of colored glass, and masks of thin talc and of India rubber. 
there were wigs of black and scarlet wools of peacock's feathers of gold and silver threads of swan's down of the tendrils of the vine of owls sleeves cut into the shapes of apocryphal animals drawers flounced down to the angles and flecked with tiny red roses stockings clocked with fete galant and curious designs and petticoats cut like artificial flowers some of the women had put on delightful little moustaches dyed in purples and bright greens twisted and waxed with absolute skill and some wore great white beards after the manner of saint wilgefort then durat had painted extraordinary grotesques and vignettes over their bodies here and there upon a cheek an old man scratching his horned head upon a forehead an old woman teased by an impudent armour upon a shoulder an amorous singerie round a breast a circlet of satyrs about a wrist a wreath of pale unconscious babes upon an elbow a bouquet of spring flowers across a back some surprising scenes of adventure at the corners of a mouth tiny red spots and upon a neck a flight of birds a caged parrot a branch of fruit a butterfly a spider a drunken dwarf or simply some initials the supper provided by the ingenious Rambouillet was quite beyond parallel never had he created a more exquisite menu the consommé impromptu alone would have been sufficient to establish the immortal reputation of any chef what then can i say of the dorade bouillé sauce maréchal the ragout au lac de carpe the rameau à la charnier the cibolet de gibure à la espagnole the pâté de suisse d'oie au pois de Montsalvi, the quedagnot au clé de lune the artichon à la grec the charlotte de palme à la lucy waters the balms à la marais and the glace aux rayons d'eau a veritable tour de cuisine that surpassed even the famous little suppers given by the marquise de rachal at passy and which the abbe mirliton pronounced impeccable and too good to be eaten ah pierre antoine brequin de rambouillet you are worthy of your divine mistress mere hunger quickly gave place to those finer instincts of pure gourmet and the strange wines cooled in buckets of snow unloosed all the decolette spirits of astonishing conversation and atrocious laughter as the courses advanced the conversation grew bustling and more personal pulex and Ciro, and marisca and Catalan opened a fire of raillery and a thousand amatory follies of the day were discussed from harsh and shrill and clamant the voices grew blurred and inarticulate bad sentences were helped out by worse gestures and at one table scabius expressed himself like the famous old knight in the first part of the soldier's fortune of otway basilisa and lestrada tried to pronounce each other's names and became very affectionate in the attempt and tala the tragedian robed in roomy purple and wearing plume and buskin rose to his feet and with swaying gestures began to recite one of his favorite parts he got no further than the first line but repeated it again and again with fresh accents and intonations each time and was only silenced by the approach of the asparagus that was being served by the satyrs dressed in white chapter four it was always delightful to wake up in a new bedroom the fresh wallpaper the strange pictures the positions of doors and windows imperfectly grasped the night before are revealed with all the charm of surprise when we open our eyes the next morning it was about eight o'clock when friend felucci woke stretched himself deliciously in his great plumed four-post bed murmured what a pretty room and freshened the frilled silk pillows behind him through the slim parting of the long flowered window curtains he caught a peep of the sunlit lawns outside the silver fountains the bright flowers the gardeners at work and beneath the shady trees some early breakfasters dressed for a day's hunting in the distant wooded valleys how sweet it all is exclaimed abbe yawning with infinite content then he lay back in his bed stared at the curious patterned canopy above him and nursed his waking thoughts he thought of the romant de la rose beautiful but all too brief of the claude in the lady delaware's collection of a wonderful pair of blonde trousers he would get madame belleville to make for him of a mysterious park full of faint echoes and romantic sounds of a great stagnant lake that must have held the subtlest frogs that ever were and was surrounded with dark unreflected trees and sleeping fleur de luce of saint rose the well-known peruvian virgin how she vowed herself to perpetual virginity when she was four years old how she was beloved by mary who from the pale fresco in the church of saint dominic would stretch out her arms to embrace her 
how she built a little oratory at the end of the garden and prayed and sang hymns in it till all the beetles spiders snails and creeping things came round to listen how she promised to marry ferdinand de flores and on the bridal morning perfumed herself and painted her lips and put on her wedding frock and decked her hair with roses and went up to a little hill not far without the walls of lima how she knelt there some moments calling tenderly upon our lady's name and how saint mary descended and kissed rose upon the forehead and carried her up swiftly into heaven he thought of the splendid opening of racine's britannicus of a strange pamphlet he had found in helen's library called a plea for the domestication of the unicorn of the bacchanals of sporian of morales's madonnas with their high egg-shaped creamy foreheads and well-crimped silken hair of rossini's stabat mater that delightfully demande piece of decadence with a quality in its music like the bloom upon wax fruit of love and of a hundred other things then his half-closed eyes wandered about the prints that hung upon the rose-striped walls within the delicate curved frames lived the corrupt and gracious creatures of dorrit and his school slender children in mask and domino smiling horribly exquisite lechers leaning over the shoulders of smooth doll-like girls and doing nothing in particular terrible little perros posing as lady lovers and pointing at something outside the picture and unearthly fops and huge bird-like women mingling in some rococo room lighted mysteriously by the flicker of a dying fire that throws great shadows upon the wall and ceiling van verluch had taken some books to better them one was witty extravagant tuesday and josephine another was the score of the rheingold making a pulpit of his knees he propped up the opera before him and turned over the pages with a loving hand and found it delicious to attack wagner's brilliant comedy with the cool head of the morning once more he was ravished with the beauty and wit of the opening scene the mystery of its prelude that seems to come upon the very mud of the rhine and to be as ancient the abominable primitive wantonness of the music that follows the talk and movements of the rhine maidens the black hateful sounds of alberic's love-making and the flowing melody of the river of legends but it was the third tableau that he applauded most that morning the scene where logi like some flamboyant primeval scapin practices his cunning upon alberic the feverish insistent ringing of the hammers at the forge the dry staccato restlessness of mime the ceaseless coming and going of the troop of nibblings drawn hither and thither like a flock of terror-stricken and infernal sheep alberic's savage activity and metamorphoses and Loge's rapid, flaming, tongue-like movements, made the tableau the least reposeful, most troubled, and confusing thing in the whole range of opera. How the abbé rejoiced in the extravagant monstrous poetry, the heated melodrama, and splendid agitation of it all. At eleven o'clock, Fran Felucci got up and slipped off his dainty nightdress. His bathroom was the largest and perhaps the most beautiful apartment in his splendid suite the well-known engraving by lorette that forms the frontispiece de millevoy's architecture du eighteen cecile will bring you a better idea than any words of mine of the construction and decoration of the room only in lorette's engraving the bath sunk into the middle of the floor is a little too small fran Freluch stood for a moment like narcissus gazing at his reflection in the still scented water and then just ruffling its smooth surface with one foot stepped elegantly into the cool basin and swam round it twice very gracefully however it is not so much at the very bath itself as in the drying and delicious frictions that a bather finds his chiefest joys and helen had appointed her most tried attendants to wait upon fran Freluch. he was more than satisfied with their attention that aroused feelings within him almost amounting to gratitude and when the rites were ended any touch of homesickness he might have felt was utterly dispelled after he had rested a little and sipped his chocolate he wandered into the dressing-room where under the direction of the superb dancourt his toilet was completed as pleased as lord foppington with his appearance the abbe tripped off to bid good morning to helen he found her in a sweet white muslin frock wandering upon the lawn and plucking flowers to deck her breakfast table he kissed her lightly upon the neck i'm just going to feed adolph she said pointing to a little reticule of buns that hung from her arm adolph was her pet unicorn he is such a dear she continued milk white all over excepting his nose mouth and nostrils this way the unicorn had a very pretty palace of its own made of green foliage and golden bars a fitting home for such a delicate and dainty beast 
Ah, it was a splendid thing to watch the white creature roaming in its artful cage, proud and beautiful, knowing no mate, and coming to no hand except the queen's itself. As Fran Freluch and Helen approached, Adolphe began prancing and curveting, pawing the soft turf with his ivory hoofs, and flaunting his tail like a gonfalon. Helen raised the latch and entered. "'You mustn't come in with me. Adolphe is so jealous,' she said, turning to the abbe, who was following her. "'But you can stand outside and look on. Adolphe likes an audience.' Then in her delicious fingers she broke the spicy buns, and with affectionate niceness breakfasted her snowy pet. When the last crumbs had been scattered, Helen brushed her hands together and pretended to leave the cage, without taking any further notice of Adolphe. Adolphe snored. End of Under the Hill by Aubrey Beardsley